Hey, what's up, Thrippy? I'm coming to you live from my dining room. I'm going to go over the uh, Introduction to Human Anatomy and Physiology notes for Unit 1. This would be Unit 1, Part 1. So here we go. Um, anatomy physiology is essentially um, a subcategory for the broad study of biology, which is the study of life, as you know from your prefix and suffixes, uh, bio and L-O-G-Y or L-O-E. Um, but in biology, any living organism performs simple basic structures and what you're going to do is you're going to find that one of the big ones is responsiveness this is a response to irritability and irritability what you're going to find that term is actually going to be stimulus uh, throughout the entire rest of the anatomy career but um, it's responsive to any stimulus and immediate change in the environment and you have to understand that environment can be both internal and external environment up until this point your environment has always been um, the area in which you live or the area in which you survive but what you have to also understand when we study human anatomy and physiology that environment actually has internal components so if you think about it your body responds internally and externally for example internally um, you eat spoiled food or something along those, that nature your body recognizes that stimulus of microorganisms that aren't supposed to be there and one of the responses to that environment is throwing up which that is the adaptability or the ability to make adjustments to the environment. External stimuli that you could respond to would be things like um, temperature change. So when temperature change occurs, your body responds to that immediate change in its environment or a high temperature, uh, indicating the low temperature, but a high temperature it makes an adjustment by sweating. In this one, real simple reflexes or reflex arcs or even um, positive and negative feedback loops are both uh, examples of responsiveness to the environment for example grabbing a hot pot, pot or pan and letting it go um, all organisms or things that exhibit life uh, grow organisms become larger over time whether by increasing in cell numbers or by increasing in cell size humans do both of these things but almost all humans grow mostly by increase in cell number um, cell differentiate differentiation occurs in multicellular organisms what that means is in multicellular organisms cells become uh, specific or specialized or have specific jobs even though all cells share the same characteristics not all cells have the same structure or roles which that results in cell differentiation um, as you can see from newborn to adult growth does occur and this does occur in both cell number and cell size um, another thing all living organisms do is they reproduce or create generations of similar, similar organisms or pass down traits. This kind of comes into play where all cells come from pre-existing cells, which is one of the central dogmas of biology. But, um, for example, here's me and my son Owen when he was, uh, oh man, less than a year old. Um, all organisms also exhibit movement. This is internally by moving stuff throughout the body. This is things like our circulatory system, our digestive system, and also externally by moving through their environment, which would be some kind of locomotion. Um, other examples internally is when you swallow your food, you actually have what is called peristalsis, which is the contraction of muscles of the esophagus, which forces food from your mouth down into the stomach. And another thing is metabolism. Up until this point, you've probably heard of metabolism as your body's ability to um, burn energy, I guess you could say, which then adjusts weight and how people have fast metabolism or slow metabolism. Metabolism as a whole from the biological standpoint is simply just all the chemical operations that undergo in a body that help you provide movement, reproduction, growth, all of the other components of living organisms. For example, what goes in, what goes out, has to balance in some way, that is metabolism. So what is anatomy itself? That is simply just the study of the structures of the body and how they're put together and what goes with what. Um, physiology, on the other hand, is the study of how a, body's, a body works. But the two are tied together, and in order to study anatomy and physiology, dissections have to be done. Imagine how little we would know about the human body if, in fact, nobody ever dissected or dove into, I guess you could say, what the inside of a human body looks like. In order to do this, there actually also has to be some set or rigorous procedures for this. For example, 
That is why we have specific set planes, transverse plane, mid-sagittal plane, parasagittal plane. All of these things are done so there's a common language of communication and dissections to understand what kind of cuts or dissections are being done to organisms. Um, for example, if you were studying the skeletal system, just the anatomy of it, you would know the bone names and the parts of the bone. So, for example, your femur, which is the largest leg and your our largest bone in your leg, you would also know that it has a part called the greater trochanter, which is at the top of the femur, which is like the it looks like it's a handle almost on the femur. Okay, physiology is how the body works uh, or functions. So if you were studying physiology of the skeletal system, you would find out what it does. For example, if you didn't already know this, all blood cells and your blood itself, white blood cells, red blood cells, are created inside bones, but more specifically bone marrow, and that is called hemopoiesis. So what are the big picture themes or in anatomy physiology? Well, one of the big things you have to understand is there are these things called biological levels of organization. Um, and we start out with an atom and everything builds upon itself. So on the foundation level, we are composed of atoms and, and we rely on atoms and different elements to survive. When you take a group of atoms or elements and you put them together, you get molecules or compounds. Again, not quite at the biological level of organization, but when you take several molecules or compounds and put them together to serve a similar function, you end up with the organelles of cells. When you have several organelles working towards a common function, you end up with cells. Cell is the, the smallest unit of life, or the smallest anything get an individual cell and still be considered alive. So you take a bunch of cells working together for a common function and you get tissue. This is where cell and tissue, where we come into in the anatomy physiology portion. Because you have a group of cells that serve a similar function, they work together to form tissue. Here's the thing about cells. Cells, what we learned from earlier, differentiate towards a common function. For example, even though you might have muscle cells and intestinal lining cells and stomach cells and brain cells and all of these different, um, and skin cells, all of them actually have a different function, which then results in a different type of structure. So if you take all cells with a similar function and put them together, that's where you get tissue. That's why we have different types of tissue. Uh, skin tissue, heart tissue, cardiac tissue, etc. If you take a group of tissue that works together towards a common function, what you end up with is in fact an organ. Here are the four main groups of types of tissue. You have connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. We'll dive more deeply into those in the second unit. When you get to the organ level, <clears throat> for example, your heart is an organ, things of that nature, this is a group of tissue working together towards a common function. When you get several organs working together towards one common function, you get an organ system. For example, here's your circulatory system. And if we move backwards again, you, your circulatory system is composed of several organs working together. Your heart, your arteries, your veins, your capillaries, all of these things working together towards one function, which is to circulate blood throughout the body. If you break that down in smaller, one organ inside the circulatory system is the heart, you have cardiac tissue, and you have cardiac cells. All of those things build and build and build and build and build until you get an entire organism. So when you have several organ systems working together towards one common function, which believe it or not that common function is homeostasis, you end up with an entire organism. You can actually go beyond the organism level for biological levels of organization, but for all practical purposes in this class, we, this is not an ecology class or anything, so we're not going to go past really organism at all. So you probably have noticed that this entire class is divided into units and those units surround specifically around organ systems. The organ systems we're going to go through, for example, are the integumentary system. This is um, what most people would uh, associate with is your skin, but it's beyond that. It's your uh, skin, hair, nails, sweat glands. It's the largest, your skin is the largest organ in the entire body, but um, mostly protects against environmental hazards regulates body temperature, things of that nature. You have the skeletal system, most people are familiar with that in terms of bones, but it also includes cartilage, ligaments, joints, um, bone marrow, provides protections for soft tissue, stores mineral, and forms blood. Muscular, provides locomotion. Locomotion is just a fancy word for movement. It provides support, it's what keeps your body upright in collaboration with the skeletal system, 
and it includes muscles and tendons. Tendons are extensions of muscle that in turn attach them to bones. You have the nervous system. Nervous system could be considered, I guess you could say, the control system for the entire body, but it directs immediate response to stimuli or that irritability, usually by coordinating activities of other organ systems. So the central nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system uh, coordinate the activities of other things. For example, your brain tells your muscles to contract, which results in locomotion or movement, etc., etc. You have the endocrine system. Now, this system we are not going to dive into into this class. Well, for one reason, because of time constraints, but for other reasons of um, level of difficulty, it's a little bit beyond some of the stuff that we were going to handle in this class. But these are your long-term changes in activities of other organ systems, and it includes a large amount of glands. This is things like um, puberty and such. The cardiovascular system transports cells and dissolved materials, nutrients, waste, and gases. Includes your heart, blood vessels, blood. You have your lymphatic system. Again, we're going to touch only like very briefly on this system for reasons of time constraints, but its main thing is it mirrors your cardiovascular system. So basically you have lymphatic vessels that um, mirror the routes of your cardiovascular system or your blood vessels in order to defend against infection. So it's kind of like a filtering system for your blood before things enter your actual bloodstream. These include lymphatic vessels, nodes, your spleen, your thymus. Whenever you're sick, a lot of times you have a throat infection of some kind, the doctor will feel your throat right here, looking for swollen lymph nodes, which is an indication of infection in the body, considering it defends against infection. You have your respiratory system. Everybody associates this with his lungs, but we have to have the accessory structure or also. So it includes like your nose, your mouth, the nasal cavities, the sinus, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, and lungs. When we talk about how your body produces sound, we will actually or your voice is produced, we'll actually do this when we talk about the respiratory system. Digestive system, uh, the absorption and processing of nutrients and waste. This includes anything from your salivary glands, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, intestines, liver, gallbladder, pancreas. If you notice, some organs actually overlap into other organ systems. You have your urinary system. Seems simple enough, but it's actually one of the more complex systems in the body. It eliminates excess water, salts, waste products. It reabsorbs things that you need so your body doesn't have to continually produce them or get them from the external environment. These are your kidneys, your ureters, your urinary, urinary bladder, and your urethra. Almost all the urinary system structures are incorporated within the pelvic cavity. And you have the reproductive system, um, produces sex cells and hormones, um, regulates a lot of your regular body functions throughout your entire life. And we're going to pause right there for just a moment.